May 1798. At the head of an army of 40,000 men, Napoleon Bonaparte embarks on the conquest of Egypt. His aim is to drive out the Mamelukes who are occupying Egypt, which is a part of the Ottoman Empire, and thereby cut off England's route to the Indies and disrupt her trade. Certain of victory, Bonaparte takes along 167 scholars from all disciplines whose mission is to support the military campaign and to study all aspects of Egypt with a view to a lasting occupation. But while the French army earns an important victory over the Mamelukes at the Battle of the Pyramids, its fleet is destroyed by the English. With no way to return, Bonaparte is now a prisoner of his own conquest, and another enemy is advancing. The Ottoman Empire, which does not want to see the French gain control over Egypt. Bonaparte decides to take the initiative and embarks on a military campaign against Syria, where the Ottoman and Mameluke forces are gathered. The scholars Monge and Bertholet accompany Bonaparte, while Villiers, Jolois, and a small group of scientists travel up the Nile to the south, which they're eager to visit. Alas, after weeks of traveling, we arrive in Luxor at night. We will have to be patient a little longer. My God, this night will be so long, given that we are itching to apply our rulers, our compasses, and plumb lines to the walls and columns which have stood here for centuries. Even the soldiers, who until now only saw us as a burden and source of problems when they had to accompany us, and who understand nothing of the reasons for our presence and our interest in what they call old stones. Even these soldiers were lost in admiration before the vestiges of the temple of Karnak. They paid tribute to the beauty of this site before these ruins fell back into the silence in which they had stood for so long. What does it say down there? That it's not vertical. <laughs> <laughs> what brings you here? I could ask the same of you. No, you first. Oh, I'm going back to Cairo with General Dezé. I can't take any more from Cairo to Aswan to the Red Sea. <laughs> I've been racing from one to the other. We just received authorization to go to Aswan. What's it like? Oh, it's nowhere near as good as Philae. From the point of view of the harmony of the proportions, it's one of the most beautiful things you can see in Egypt. Oh, where can we sit down? I want to show you something splendid. Uh, right Come here. On. Only one single time, General Dezé had a unique objective, capturing Murad Bey. Only once did he allow us to make a halt. It was at Dendera, 80 kilometers from here. There's a temple three quarters buried in the sand. And at the back, there was a room which we reached by climbing on the roof. We found this on the ceiling. Oh. I only had time to do this rather poor drawing. But if you go there, and I strongly urge you to, you must produce some better ones. From what I was told, this zodiac is an outstanding testimony to the astrological knowledge of the ancient Egyptians. It's magnificent. Before the Egypt expedition, there were explorers who traveled individually to Egypt and who pretty much sketched what they saw. Here, for the first time, we've got engineering graduates, we've got architects, we've got people who are trained in drawing and who are precise. Many of them are Monge's students, young people who apply geometric principles and scientific methods to their work and their way of illustrating the monuments. Unlike the older scholars, such as Denon, who always adds a little tree or an animal to his sketches, in this case, they reproduce what they see, so that from a scientific point of view, it is indisputable. After long months of being confined in the north, Villiers and Jolois are finally in the heart of Egypt's archaeological riches. And Karnak is only one stop on a journey that will take them farther south to places whose inaccessibility has rendered them mythical. That's enough of our travels. 
What about General Dusay? Tell us how things are going in Syria. Tell us the news. <sighs> don't tell me you don't know. I won't believe you. Did something happen to Saint Hilaire? No, as far as I know, he's fine. What about Monge? Oh, he's safe too. Mm. <sighs> tell them what you told me, will you? He was with the expedition. It was he who brought the news of the Syria campaign. Syria? We're not there yet. Perhaps we never will be. Everything went fine until the taking of Gaza and Jaffa. Jaffa fell in a day. 2,000 Ottoman fighters killed and 3,000 taken prisoner. The following day, Bonaparte, he didn't want to be burdened with prisoners. He ordered, he didn't know how he could feed them. And he didn't want to let them go so they could fight against us again. So, want some water? No, wine. Here. Carry on. He ordered them to be executed. They were taken to the beach and shot. When the number of bodies grew just too many, the prisoners were marched to the dunes and the massacre continued. And then, when the ammunition ran out, the rest had to be killed by bayonet. I'm a soldier. God knows I've seen dead men. But never so many corpses. People whose lives we promised would be safe if they surrendered. In addition to the massacre of prisoners, there are grave health problems. A plague epidemic sweeps through the army's ranks. The soldiers who are not affected are terrified. To restore their courage, Bonaparte, who carefully avoids uttering the word plague, tries to demonstrate that the disease is not to be feared. He pays a long visit to the sick. He helps carry the body of a soldier whose uniform is soiled by the burst, pustulant buboes, before Dejeunet, the expedition's chief physician, pushes him out, saying the visit has gone on long enough. There are two points of view among the physicians. There is the point of view of Dijonet, who thinks the word plague will crush the soldier's morale. And then there's the point of view of the surgeon, who says the soldiers should be told the truth. That way they can take measures to avoid spreading the disease. In particular, they will understand why they are told not to take the clothes of victims. There is a debate on this subject, and Bonaparte settles the matter, backing de Jeunet's view. The French army takes Gaza and Jaffa so easily that everyone thinks all they have to do is show up in front of St. John of Acre and the Pasha in charge will surrender. The reality is quite different. Bonaparte has besieged the town for two months now, day and night. Attack follows attack, but to no avail, and resulting in heavy losses among the French troops and officers. General Caffarelli is killed. Kleber is outraged at the scale of French losses. He writes, Bonaparte is a general at the cost of 10,000 men per day. Two English warships await the French off the coast of Haifa, to the south of St. John of Acre, and it is their commander, Sidney Smith, who is organizing the defense of the town. An officer in the English Navy, Sidney Smith is notorious for having torched the French fleet in Toulon as part of England's action against the French Revolution. He is working towards a rapprochement between England and the Ottoman Empire and has orders to thwart Bonaparte's ambitions in the East. 
To be able to overpower a place by brute force, such as when one is laying siege, it obviously requires siege artillery, which means heavy artillery. But the French no longer control the seas, so they can no longer bring in supplies by ship. And when they try to do so, they come up against the English. So this artillery never reaches Bonaparte, and he doesn't have the resources to take the town. So he has to stage an old-style blockade, like an ancient siege. But this blockade cannot work because the English are sending in supplies. So instead of a few days, the siege goes on for several months. The Syria campaign grinds to a halt at St. John of Acre, and Bonaparte has no choice but to retreat. He doesn't want to spread the plague epidemic by taking the sick back to Cairo, and reluctant to leave them to the Turkish scimitars, he gives orders for those infected to be given a fatal dose of opium. Dejeunet, the chief physician, refuses, but a compliant pharmacist carries out the grim instruction. One of the key features about the Egyptian campaign that never goes away, this was British propaganda at the time, was Napoleon kills prisoners and Napoleon commits euthanasia on his soldiers who have bubonic plague. Now, these are things that Napoleon never denies. On the return to Cairo, the toll of the Syria campaign is catastrophic. Thousands of prisoners executed hundreds of plague victims, with euthanasia for the sick. Bonaparte's army has lost some 4,500 soldiers, and all of them have died in vain. The failure of the Syria campaign sounds the death knell for his hopes of an Eastern Empire. It's all over. Bonaparte realizes that he will one day have to account for this, and he will face some criticism. All other business can wait. The only matter we have to deal with today is the creation of a committee to study the plague. And what exactly do you expect of this committee, General? The plague that spread through our troops from Jaffa to St. John of Acre took a terrible toll. It's the only thing responsible for our return to Cairo, without having conquered everything as far as Constantinople. I want to know. Indeed, I demand to know how. This sickness could have put us in a situation of leaving territory to our enemies, from where they could prepare to attack us again. Was it not simply because you were blinded by your thirst for conquest that you wanted to hide from your men the sickness of which they were victims? You published a text in which you stated this disease was not the plague! On your orders, on your orders alone, you were afraid of the effect the plague would have on your troops. Well, if you were certain of the nature of the disease, it was up to you to convince me. But perhaps you were not capable of that because you're not a real doctor but some sort of uh, charlatan. Everything's fine, everything's fine. Please leave and close the door. Armed guards in a place dedicated to science and the arts. The Egyptian air does not suit you, Citizen General. It has turned you into nothing less than an oriental despot. Come along now. This is a grave matter. But we must deal with it impartially and leave our passion to one side. I propose that this committee be created this very day, and that its aims will be clearly established and will independently carry out inquiries that are exclusively scientific and medical, with no interference from military questions. Yes, but without me. As you wish, Citizen Dejeunet. No one is forcing you. You'll play no part. Bonaparte has only just returned to Cairo from Syria when he learns that an Ottoman landing has taken place at Aboukir. The French presence in Egypt is under greater threat than ever before. But this threat coincides with a discovery that will change our understanding of ancient Egypt forever. To the east of Aboukir stands the fort of Rosetta. It's in a poor state and is in need of repair ahead of a possible Anglo-Turkish attack. In the course of the work, a heavy stell of black granite engraved in mysterious languages is unearthed. By chance, the officer who finds the stone, Captain Bouchard, is a member of the Sciences and Arts Commission. A member of the Institute of Egypt also happens to be on site. No one at this time knows how to read hieroglyphics, nor the writing that takes up the middle part of the stone. But both men can read Greek. 
The text says that this decree is written in three languages, hieroglyphic, demotic, and Greek. The text in hieroglyphs should therefore be identical to the Greek text. They realize the importance of this discovery. In the midst of the military preparations, they wrap up the stele and ship it to Cairo. Immediately, they realize that this stone, which bears the name of the Pharaoh Ptolemy, is written in each of the languages, and they think that these three texts say the same thing. From there, they can decipher the hieroglyphics. It was Jean-François Champollion who succeeded in doing this. But as he was only eight years old at the time of the Egyptian campaign, he can't have done it then, contrary to popular belief. Villiers and Jolois have reached Aswan in southern Egypt and are wholly unaware of the recent discoveries, the disastrous expedition to Syria, and the new battles that are looming. Their leader has reproached them for drawing hieroglyphs instead of taking measurements of irrigation systems. So the two young scientists set about this task as quickly as they can, whilst obstinately continuing to visit temples. Jolois, if I had made the whole trip from Paris just to see this, that would be enough to make me happy. You know what they should do? Toss away all the travelers' accounts published so far. They missed the best places. Well, You done? <clears throat> what did you wish for? You shouldn't tell anyone your wish. It won't come true. You believe that? I don't know. Uh, I think it only works if you believe in it. In any case, the ancient Egyptians believed in it. Our boatman also seems to believe it. Hmm. Oh! Good God, the boatman! We'd better get going. I don't think he's going to be happy sailing by night. As Villiers and Jolois struggled to find the words to describe their emotions in the face of the beauty they've discovered, a thousand kilometers to the north at Abu Kir, cannon fire rings out. Surprisingly, the Turkish forces have not taken the initiative to attack as soon as they landed. They have not moved from the Bay of Abukir, which leaves Bonaparte time to assemble his troops and march them swiftly to Abukir, where the Turks are crushed. One characteristic of these Turkish armies is they have lots and lots of followers. They're often very, very, new, very huge numbers, but never very particularly well organized. And obviously the superior firepower of the French uh, infantry uh, takes its toll. There's a lot of panache amongst the Turkish uh, fighters, notably the cavalry, but they're not very good uh, with the firearms. And so the French win every time. Aboukir 1 was the destruction of the French fleet. Aboukir 2 sees the Ottomans driven back into the sea. Aboukir 2 would erase the humiliation of Aboukir 1. The ruler of the pyramids was the winner of Aboukir. Bonaparte has just shown that he is still capable of military success, and life in Cairo returns to normal, as if nothing happened on the road to Syria. No, no. Don't be fooled. 
Like all children, I played at being a soldier, but I never imagined for a second that I'd be a general. Mm -hmm. And don't think I'm happy being one today. I bear the burden out of duty to my country, not because I want to. Why do you think I so enjoy your company? As a child, I dreamed of being an inventor. I could see myself becoming another... Newton. <laughs> Newton, having resolved the problem of attraction, there was no longer any room. <laughs> <laughs> and what do we know of the movement of the smallest of bodies? What do we know of molecules of the atom? Almost nothing. I would happily have left the planets to Newton to study the secrets of life and the universe. Mm -hmm. We will have plenty of time to continue our discussion, but now I must leave you. Gentlemen. General, I have a report that I'd like to get to the Institute of France. Would you be so good as to pass it on? Never fear, Saint-Hilaire. Your report will reach the Institute. Thank you, General. He's leaving. What? Who's leaving? The General-in-Chief is returning to France. And leaving behind his army? I bet my life on it. <sighs> Under cover of night, Monge and Berthollet, the scientific leaders, and the artist Vivant Denon have their personal effects taken discreetly to Aboukir. They're just waiting for one last passenger and an important one, the organizer of this clandestine trip. One year after his arrival in Egypt, Bonaparte sets sail to return to France. Bonaparte leaves the army without telling anyone, not even his successor, General Kleber, who he has appointed general-in-chief in his place. Kleber learns the news from a letter. He's furious, but since he is now in charge of this army, which is still in some difficulty, he makes an address to the soldiers in which he hides his true feelings. My soldiers, Imperial duties dictate that the General-in-Chief Bonaparte has gone to France. Powerful reinforcements will arrive, or else a glorious peace will carry you back to your homeland. In receiving the burden which Bonaparte had to carry, I feel its importance and all that is arduous about it. But on the other hand, I appreciate your worth. I only have to think about the honor of being at your head, the honor of commanding you, and my strength swells. The truth is that after the disastrous Syria campaign, Kleber is inheriting a catastrophic situation. He writes to the Directoire, pointing out the lack of weapons and munitions and the loss of a great many men. He overstates matters somewhat to push his appeal for help, describing soldiers going about naked and with nothing to eat since the supplies were exhausted, but this tactic will soon work against him. At the moment Bonaparte sets foot in France, contrary to what one might imagine, he has, after all, left his army. Almost deserted, as some would say. Bonaparte is welcomed in triumph. For months in the Republic, there have been rumors of a coup d'état. The Directoire, the ruling regime at the time, has undergone several in the previous years, and you have to bear in mind that the Directeur, Emmanuel Sieyès, who has just come to power, is himself preparing a coup, and to carry this out, he needs a general, or a sabre, as he calls it. After pondering who could act as this sabre, he learns of Bonaparte's return from Egypt, and the general who was present with him, General Moreau, says, there's your man, he can lead a coup much better than me. Making the most of his prestige and the confusion that reigns at the highest level of state, Bonaparte overthrows the regime and seizes power. He now has more pressing concerns than what's happening in Egypt. Unaware of their leader's departure, Villiers and Jolois let their crew return to Cairo and stop at Thebes opposite Luxor, where they'd not enough time on the outward journey. This time, they have several weeks to explore the region. This one looks quite good, don't you think? Yes. In any case, much better than Dunnall's. Yes. 
We should make some copies for the astronomers at the Commission. They'll make a better use of it than uh, we will. I'm sure they will. I don't know anything about astronomy. <clears throat> He's been saying for an hour that he wants to talk to the men who do the drawings. I'm sick of him. What shall I do? Send him packing? Do you speak Arabic? I've learned a few words. Stay, you can help if there are words we don't understand. Yes. Spread it out. Can I see this? Take. How much? Ask him how much he wants for this. Shalesh. Hida. Harman. Four. Harman. Four. This this is four? Hida. Just ahead. After searching as far as we could for mummies, we turned to one of those men who make a profession of grave robbing to find amulets and other objects which they sell for high prices. I wouldn't mind that. Shalesh? Zeus. Ask him where we found them. Where'd you find it? Under our questioning, he told us that one day in the nearby mountain, mummies of dogs had been found. I promised him a rich reward if he took us to the place where these mummies were. Villiers and Jolois hoped to find embalmed human bodies, but had to make do with mummified animals. But in the course of their excavation, they make a far more important discovery. Since the days of ancient Rome, 11 tombs had been discovered in the Valley of the Kings in Thebes, where the pharaohs were buried. The two young scholars find a 12th. When we return to France, we'll be missing one thing. The name of the pharaoh for whom this tomb was dug. It's no doubt written somewhere on the walls. Yes, but we can't read it. Don't let that stop you copying it all. Perhaps someone will manage to decipher it. Don't worry, they'll find our bones in two or three thousand years and think this tomb was for us. The young scholars are a real gift from France, given to the ancient Egyptian civilization. Despite all the political and military difficulties they encounter, the young scholars find the time to make sketches of the ancient monuments. They analyze them, visit them, compare them, and then write reports, which afterwards they present to the Institute of Cairo. We have done a lot of good work, and friend Saint-Hilaire is of the same opinion. But we have amassed such a quantity of measurements and drawings that sorting them all into order can only be done on our return to Cairo or better still, France. Because I think we have now fulfilled our mission and we can serenely contemplate returning home. We were in the middle of copying the hieroglyphs and suddenly the light went out. We hadn't paid any attention to the candle, thank you. We had to crawl out following the wall, patting our hands along the floor because in the middle of the corridor, there was a drop of about 10 meters. I think Vilya found it a little unnerving. Well, can you tell me what we're doing here right now? We must have at least 10,000 hieroglyphs still to copy. That's not amusing. Mange, Donau and Bertolet have left. Why don't we return? The English. The English don't care a fig about us. There's no point arguing. If you want my opinion, Bonaparte brought us here so we would boost his glory by teaching the French about the country he was set to conquer. Mm. Liberate. Oh, if you prefer, liberate then conquer. And now he's gone, Kleber is keeping us here because uh, he doesn't want to take responsibility for bringing Bonaparte's mission to an end. If... if that's the case, we may be here for a while yet. Indeed, maybe it's written in the stars that we'll be buried in this damn country. To science. To science. And to knowledge. To, to knowledge. knowledge. 
Powerful reinforcements or a glorious peace, Kleber had promised his soldiers. But now he's given up on those reinforcements. So he instructs General Desai to negotiate with the English representative, Sidney Smith, an agreement to evacuate Egypt. I will carry out my task as best I can, but why sign an accord so quickly? As a soldier, I'm convinced that it is still possible to beat the Ottoman army, which would allow us to then negotiate with England from a position of strength. I'm confident that you can defeat the Ottomans, Desai. But even in defeat, they will come back with fresh forces. The Mamelukes were beaten, and yet they are still a danger. And the Egyptian population has not been won over by the French presence, and never will be. They could rebel again. Each battle won leaves us weakened. And if we must continue to fight, England just has to wait until we no longer exist. At least let's drag out the negotiation while we await aid. Still this idea of being in a position of strength again? Still this idea that all those battles were not in vain. Don't hold out any false hopes, Dizay. We have no fleet left and will never receive reinforcements. How can France send aid to Egypt when it needs all of its forces to fight against the anti-Republican coalition? Now it's up to the army in Egypt to find a way to return to France as soon as possible to fight for the Republic. We cannot hope for better than an agreement to evacuate Egypt negotiated with Sidney Smith. General Menu is fiercely opposed to this, unless it's in the framework of a peace accord for the whole Mediterranean. Neither Sidney Smith nor myself have a mandate to negotiate an overall peace deal in the Mediterranean. Let's consider ourselves lucky that the Ottomans have signed the treaty and that the English do not hold us prisoner. Very well. Goodbye, Desai. Desai and Kleber are both seeking an honorable way to bring an end to the French presence in Egypt. Desai by continuing the war, Kleber through an immediate cessation of combat. It's the English who will force the two men to reach agreement. General. No, thank you. My government has decided not to ratify your accord with Sidney Smith. It didn't need to be ratified. My government decided differently. Nelson? The point of view of Admiral Nelson prevails, indeed. While our two countries are at war in Europe, my government does not want to see your soldiers return from Egypt to swell the ranks of the French army. That is unworthy coming from an officer. Sir Sidney Smith was dismissed for concluding that accord with you. Your letter to your government detailing the deplorable situation your armies are in was intercepted. It carried considerable weight in my government's decision. We will only accept a capitulation under which the French will surrender their weapons and consider themselves prisoners. Never. You think our army is beaten, but you will find out that it is not. If we have to, we will fight. Our response to this insult will be victory. Mm -hmm. Kleber is facing a very difficult situation, since the Egyptians also realize how weak the French are, and the English and Ottomans are at the gate. Contrary to what one might think, the army is not as dismayed by Bonaparte's departure as some have said. This is because, to some extent, Kleber seems like the man for the moment. He is a great general who has led a glorious campaign in Germany. Among the troops, there are some who have been following him for a long time. So there is a very tight bond between the rank and file and Kleber. Kleber now finds himself with three enemies, the Mamelukes, the Ottoman Empire, and the English. He must at all costs prevent the Ottomans reaching Cairo and rallying the inhabitants to drive out the French, whom the English could then just pick off. The soldiers just want to return to France. 
instead of which Kleber asked them to fight again. Some 40,000 Ottomans, joined by 20,000 Mamluks under Ibrahim Bey, amassed a few kilometers from Cairo. Kleber can only muster 11,000, including 1,500 cavalry. The Ottomans and the Mamluks are five or six times more numerous than the French. After several hours' march and an initial victorious clash with an advance guard of some 6,000 Ottomans, the French army faces the bulk of the Ottoman and Mameluk forces, more than 50,000 men. At noon, thousands of horsemen charge towards Kleber's forces. The engineer Malus recalls, the cavalry charged wave after wave. The Ottomans let out war cries circling rapidly around us. They surrounded us, blocking out the horizon. It goes on for hours. Throughout the day, successive waves sweep down and attack Kleber's square formations over and over again. By the evening, Kleber's army is still facing charges by Ottoman and Mameluk cavalry. But the strategy of infantry squares proves effective. Depleted, exhausted, the enemy leaves the battlefield at midnight. The French have lost 600 soldiers, the enemy more than 8,000 men. This was one of Kleber's greatest victories. In his memoirs, Bonaparte writes of the awakening of the Lion Kleber, ready to hang on to the Egyptian lands until a general peace agreement settles the fate of the expeditionary army. While Kleber is fighting the Turks and the English, the Egyptians profit from the situation and revolt against the French in Cairo. And so Kleber has to rush back from Heliopolis to put down this second uprising in Cairo. It's a very serious event, takes Kleber 30 days, I think, to put it down. Uh, he loses 500 men fighting from house to house. He is like a surgeon cutting out a cancer bit by bit in order to conserve the army's supplies, food, munitions and ships, which are kept at the port of Bulak. The second revolt in Cairo is more violent and bloody than the first, although there are fewer victims. Kleber wants to teach the Egyptians a lesson, to demonstrate the power of the French army, and that he is still the strong man in Egypt. It takes Kleber 35 days and the loss of 500 men to take back control of Cairo. Subsequently, he restores order to the administration, refills the coffers by collecting taxes, and totally brings to heel a country which was running away from him a month before. Kleber no longer talks about returning to France, knowing it to be impossible. This suits the English, but it's not to the liking of the Grand Vizier, head of the Ottoman armies, who has Kleber assassinated by a fanatical student who himself is captured and impaled in a public square. Obviously, Kleber could not appoint a successor, and so the usual rule is applied. The oldest of the division's generals takes command of the army, meaning General Menou. He is a figure who is not widely liked, I think, and is certainly not uh, appreciated for his abilities. Uh, he does his best. He converts to Islam in the hope that somehow this might make a difference, but it doesn't really. Um, he's criticized for having named his son by the, with the same name as the man who killed Kleber. <laughs> so, it, he has a totally different approach from his predecessors. Are you thirsty? You 
know, to begin with, I didn't like you. I was like my comrade. I thought you were just a burden on our mission. And now, having spent weeks with you in the desert, I understand. Gentlemen, I have a message for you. All soldiers accompanying artists or scientists have orders to rejoin their units immediately. Gentlemen. Don't stay here. You'll get yourself killed for nothing. All troops, fall in. Forward, march! It's over. Monu didn't oppose us while Bonaparte and Kleber wanted to see our work advance. But now he's abandoning us. All this will only be good for lighting a fire. If we cannot complete what we have started, all this will have been in vain. The asses. The asses. The asses. Oh, yes, General Manu, Mr. Abdallah Manu. Perhaps we are asses, as you claim. But if anything is to remain of this expedition, it will be what we have brought back. Certainly not your command. How could this general, who's not fit to run the kitchens, find himself at the head of the army? Who would you have put there? With Kleber assassinated and Dussé gone, there's no one else. What do we do now? If you want to get yourself killed for nothing, we carry on alone, without escort. Otherwise, we go back to Cairo. Six months ago, I was dying to see my family. Then I found a renewed taste for work. But now, I only want one thing. To go home to France. Egypt will soon be in the hands of the English and the Ottomans. We have no more business here. They will have to wait for more than a year before returning home. And before that, Manu, who dreams of turning Egypt into a French colony, will suffer a crushing defeat. When the English land in Abukir, supported by the arrival of an Ottoman army, General Manu takes 13 days before deciding to attack Canopus, where the English have set up camp. This leaves them time to organize their defense. Manu launches a dawn attack. By midday, the French army is beaten. After the Battle of Canopus, Manu divides his forces, Belia going to Cairo, Manu to Alexandria. And so this division, this breaking up of the army in Egypt, is the beginning of the end. Belia has no information about what's going on in Alexandria. There's no longer any communication between Alexandria and Cairo. Meliard and his army find themselves cut off from Cairo and threatened with destruction. He's forced to sign a capitulation with the English and the Ottomans. And from that moment, some 14,000 French are evacuated, and what's more, on English ships. Manu barricades himself in Alexandria. He sets up defensive positions to protect the city and stop the English occupying it, while he awaits reinforcements from France. One should always be wary of leaders who say they will hold out until they die with their men. This is what Manu promises in Alexandria, but in the end, after feeble resistance, he also capitulates. And it was thus three years after the arrival of this army of the Orient, which became the army of Egypt, the French would all return home. Yes, of course, but what the examples we have. Gentlemen, I have good news. The members of the Science and Arts Commission are authorized to embark for France. Oh, no, 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 no. There is there is, however, one condition upon which the English insist. You must all leave the entire collections you have gathered and all your studies, drawings, sketches, and copies of hieroglyphs. Oh, we didn't do all that work for nothing. These works, these works are considered as belonging to France, but constitute spoils of war for the English. Three years' work reduced to nothing. I'm as disappointed as you are, but I could obtain nothing more. There you have it. You must be satisfied with returning home safe and sound, which is something. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, General Manu. 
Well, of course. Gentlemen, 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 please. Like all of you, I want to go home and see my family. But I've collected hundreds of animals here, of all kinds, and which are unknown in Europe. And now I'm supposed to abandon them? <laughs> I'd rather die. Of course. Abdelamanu is a terrible tactician and a poor negotiator. Even if he tries to salvage any of this, I doubt he can find the words to convince the English. We must write to them. Stand there, your quill. General Manu tries to pass off the studies and collections as personal belongings, not those of the Republic. But the English general who controls the port of Alexandria will have none of that. The scholars issue a threat. Rather than see our work stolen, we will destroy it, scatter it in the sands, or toss it into the sea. From the Science and Arts Commission of the French Republic to the General Commander of Alexandria. No, we will not give in. No, we will not allow such a sacrifice to be carried out. We ourselves will burn our treasures. Count on the judgment of history. You too will have burned a library in Alexandria. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire finds the right words. The loss of the Library of Alexandria, which housed tens of thousands of papyrus scrolls, was a symbol of cultural destruction. The English general in command at Alexandria does not want to be held responsible for the loss of studies carried out by French scientists. He gives in. The scholars can keep their collections, papers, and certain antiques that they have gathered. All these objects will be considered personal effects that cannot be seized, on condition that they may be carried by the scholars themselves. Alas, the stone discovered at Rosetta is too heavy to be carried by a single man and must be left to the English. The French scholars keep only copies. The elements contrive to make the return voyage an additional trial, underlining the fiasco of the end of the Egyptian campaign. Don't worry, everything's fine. <laughs> you find this funny? <laughs> All we need now is to sink to complete the picture. <laughs> Of the 167 scholars who initially landed in Egypt, 25 have either died from sickness or been slain. The others trickle back to France with the soldiers on ships which, by quirk of fate, fly the English flag. When, after six weeks of a harsh voyage, the members of the Sciences and Arts Commission arrive in Toulon on the 6th of November, 1801, the health services send them on to Marseille. Since the hospitals are full of sick and injured soldiers returning from Egypt, the scientists are placed in quarantine in a freezing cold warehouse where they must remain for another month itching to get home. Oh, I see. Good God! They're treating us like animals! We're not staying here for 40 days. We're just cattle. Fetch your desk and quill. We must write them a letter. Kleber wanted all the scholars on the expedition to bring together their work in a single groundbreaking publication. Ten years later, the description of Egypt, the sum of all the work by the Science and Arts Commission, marked the birth of a new science, Egyptology. At Napoleon's request, the description of Egypt is published in a sumptuous edition, illustrated by hundreds of drawings which would make modern and ancient Egypt known to the French public. 
It's above all the reproductions of the temples, pyramids, palaces, and other marvels of antiquity which will leave the greatest impression. Bonaparte thus ensures that the disastrous military campaign in Egypt is forgotten. All that remains is the memory of the scientific campaign and all the beauty it reveals to the world.